So we have a graph here which says the hours of daylight per day for Iqaluit. And Iqaluit is way far up north. So it says how many hours of daylight are there on the longest day of the year? Looks like the longest day of the year, June 21st. And I guess estimating that, that looks like at about 21 hours. On the shortest day of the year, December 21st, if I would estimate that, maybe about three hours. Not as crazy as Winnipeg. I mean, not as, way crazier than Winnipeg. We're not as crazy as that. But we notice that as well, where in the summer, the days are long. And in the winter, the days are short. And now that we're getting close to October, we are in a section of the year that is right here. Do you notice it getting darker quicker? And that's because of the way this curve works. When it's during summer, you're in this section. So for a long time, the days just seem long. Okay, and I hate to tell you this, but we're going to go to this dark place called winter. And there's going to be a long time where the sun is just like dark right away. And then we're going to enter spring again, and spring is going to be super exciting because you're going to notice the change. You might be noticing the change right now, that it's getting darker earlier and earlier, and it seems like it's changing fast. And it feels like it's changing fast because we just went from this summertime where it doesn't change very much over a long period of time, and now it's changing quickly. And this graph is the graph of sine theta and cos theta. So we're going to find out how to graph sine theta and cos theta and how it's related to this. And we're going to find out that the sine graph and the cosine graph relate to anything that repeats itself in a cycle. Because sine and cos theta work with the unit circle, then anything that repeats itself with a cycle in a circle, the graph ends up looking like this. And one of these examples is daylight hours. <coughs> Do you expect this pattern to repeat? Yeah. Has it ever been like in a winter? Oh my goodness. All of a sudden, our winters are short. Our winters have like sunlight all day long. And our, winter, and our summers change? No. It repeats itself. It has a cycle over and over again. And so this cycle is our sine and our cosine graphs. So what I'd like you to do is turn to page 514. And on 514, they have the sine graph. But I would like you to draw this sine graph right beside it. I'll make that a little bigger for you. Because what we're going to do when we graph the sine graph is we're going to use our axis family. So this on page 514, just beside the other one. So there's a graph on page 514. You can take the graph and do the sine one right beside. Remember that on your unit circle, sine was the y-coordinate. So does it make sense that at zero radians, your y-coordinate was zero? Then at pi over two, your y-coordinate is one. At pi, the y-coordinate is back to zero. At three pi over two, it's down to negative one. And at two pi, it's back to zero. In fact, we can see this. We've got a little unit circle here. And I'm going to look at sine first. Sine is the y-coordinate. So if I grab this little point P on my unit circle, can you see that as I go up, the blue line, which is your y-coordinate, is getting bigger? And it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger until it gets to 1. Or jumps over 1. Doesn't like that. And then it gets smaller, but it's still positive. So can you see in the graph that this is quadrant one? 
and this is quadrant two, and sine is positive in quadrant one and quadrant two, but then when I get to quadrant three, now my y values are negative until they hit minus one at the bottom. And if you kept going around the circle over and over again, I'll fill that in, perfect, it just keep repeating itself. So this graph that we've got drawn right here, we put arrowheads on the end because the pattern repeats itself over and over and over again. In fact, you could put 5 pi over 2 on there and be back at a maximum again. And then 3 pi be back to 0, and so on over and over and over again. This is the graph of cosine. Now some things we can highlight in our notes. Okay. A function that repeats itself is called a periodic function. And we call how long that cycle is the period. So for our sine graph, our period is 2 pi. And you can measure your period by going from any minimum value to any other minimum value, or any maximum value to any maximum value. Or on this one, I think it's really easy. If you start in the middle going up, when are you back to the middle going up again? Well, at 2 pi. So you see that that distance is 2 pi, you started at 0. So sometimes starting at 0 is really nice to look for that repeat, but sometimes it's not easy to start at 0. So then you would go, well, how long is it from this maximum to the next time I get a maximum? And I count that distance. So I would do 5 pi over 2 minus 1 pi over 2, give me 4 pi over 2, which reduces to 2 pi that way as well. No matter which two points you choose, the period should be the same between those two points. Some other definitions that we're going to have. We're going to have a definition called the amplitude. The amplitude is the distance from the center line to the maximum or the center line to the minimum. How high does it go from the middle to the top and the middle to the bottom? And since the highest your sine graph ever gets is 1, and the middle is at 0, we would say the amplitude of this graph is 1. Some other important information we can highlight. We can highlight the domain is everything because it keeps on going forever. But your range is minus 1 to 1. One of the tricky things that you're going to want to find is the x-intercepts or the zeros. So I have some extra notes on this. If you want to find the zeros, what you could do is you could look at your axis family, and that's why this graph is way easier to look at. Do you see that you have a zero at, here I'll do it in purple, we have it at zero. Then we have one at pi, then we have one at two pi. What's the next one going to be at? Three pi. And so I'm going to start by just listing them. My zeros were at zero, then pi, then two pi, then three pi, and then I'll go dot, dot, dot. Can you see that it would also go backwards? And there's an infinite amount of zeros. So this is going to be connecting to what we did earlier with coterminal angles. When we wanted to write all of the coterminal angles, do you remember we did plus 360 degrees times k? So we have to recognize that here, that this has every single pi times every number. 1 pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi, 5 pi negative 1 pi, negative 2 pi, negative 3 pi. So we could write these zeros as k pi, where k is any integer. 
that would write every single zero that would be possible. And the textbook has that written down as well. Just wanted to go through an explanation of how you would find it. If you started listing them, then you see a pattern that it's every single whole number, positive or negative, every single integer times pi, which includes zero. You could write this as zero or zero pi, I guess, if you wanted. And then we can figure out the pattern and how to write it in a general form. Okay, the next graph is cosine. So beside the cosine graph, I'll get you to draw this. And again, that cosine graph has your axis family. So once again, with your cos graph, you have your axis family. Does it make sense? Your cos is your x-coordinate. So at 0, your x-coordinate is 1. At pi over 2, your x-coordinate is 0. If we look at a picture again, so now I've got cos labeled in red here. It's starting at 1. If I connect to this point P, as this point P increases. So as your angle goes from 0 to 90, cos gets close to 0. Then in quadrant 2, do you see your cast rule? Now my x-coordinate is negative until it gets down here when it's 1, and then my x-coordinate starts getting smaller. It's still negative. And then finally, now my x-coordinate is positive again, and this would repeat itself over and over and over again. There we go. So there's our sine and our cosine graphs. And again, we can look at some of the patterns with the cosine graph. So we can take out our highlighter. Amplitude is still going to be 1. Because that's the distance from your center line to the maximum. So it's still 1. Your period is still 2 pi. Again, I think it would probably be easiest to look at. It starts at a maximum at 0. When is the next maximum? Is that 2 pi. So I would use that as a way to figure out quickly that my period is 2 pi. They use two minimums. That would work as well. It's just not as easy to see from the numbers on their graph what it is. But if you start at 0 and go to 2 pi, the period is 2 pi. Once again, your domain is everything and your range is the same. The domain and range are identical. But now when we talk about the zeros of cos, and we just start writing them down. We write them down. We get 1 at pi over 2, 
1 and 3 pi over 2. Next one would be at 5 pi over 2, dot, dot, dot. And same thing in the negative direction. And so we have a pattern again. Now we're going to start writing that pattern by just looking at the numbers. Okay? Um, I'm going to ask you if you can see a pattern. I'm going to ask you, do you think that one of the zeros would be 21 pi over 2? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. What about 32 pi over 2? No. So are you noticing that these are all odd numbers? Okay. Now, if we were allowed to combine English and math together, it would sure be nice to write this. Odd pi over 2. That makes sense, right? That's the pattern you see. It uses an English word and numbers, and we explain all of them. Any odd, positive or negative, pi over 2 is our 0. But now we have to write this mathematically. So how do you write all the odd numbers in the whole world? Well, you start with all the integers. Would you include, that includes positive and negative ones. Then if you double all of them, does it make sense that if you double any integer, you will always get an even number? Right? If I start with 3 and I double it, I get 6. Even. If I start with 5 and I double it, I get 10. Even. If I start with an even number like 4 and double it, 8. Still even. For sure, this is an even number. Then if I want an odd number, I could just add one or subtract one. So this part right here is any odd number. We times that by pi over 2, where k is any integer. And we've listed every single integer. We can also write the zeros for cosine using an idea like coterminal angles. We have a zero, I'll put it on here, at pi over 2. Then you can hop to the next zero by adding pi. You can go back to the previous zero by subtracting pi. If you hop from here to this one, you'd have to subtract 2 pi. But you're adding pi every time you hop from one to the other. So another way of writing the general solution for this <coughs> would be to say, you could start with pi over 2, because that's one of them. And then if you want to find any other one, you just have to add or subtract pi as many times as you want it. So we could do pi over 2 plus k pi where k is an integer. Those are exactly the same. In fact, if you distribute the pi over 2 in the other one and simplify it, you probably can see that it's exactly the same. But the idea of creating those formulas was different. The first one, we noticed the pattern that it was odd pi over 2. So then we wrote an odd number times pi over 2. The second one uses the pattern of, well, I know one of them is at pi over 2. And any time I jump by pi, I'm going to hit another one. So I can jump by pi as many times as I want, either in the positive direction or in the negative direction. That's very similar to the idea of coterminal angles. So it's another way of thinking of it. Both of these are fine for writing the zeros of cos. Next, I'm going to get you to turn to page 516. There they have the tangent graph. Off to the side, I want you to draw the tangent graph with the axis family. So when drawing the graphs, we use the axis family to figure it out. On your axis family, tan is sometimes undefined. In the graph, that shows up as an asymptote. And on your axis family, the places where it is defined is always zero.
So then if we look at some of the things we notice here, what is the period? Well, if you started at zero, do you see at zero it's in the middle going up? When is it the middle going up again? At pi. So for tangent, pick up my highlighter, for tangent, the period is only pi. And because the tangent graph goes up forever and down forever, there is no amplitude. Because amplitude is from the center to the maximum, but there is no maximum. There is no minimum. In fact, we can label our domain and our range. Oh, let's start with the range, because the range is easy. But the domain is a little bit harder. And actually, I don't like the way that they've written it, so it's quite, they used a little bit of the English and a little bit of the math together, so they wrote it this way. It should be a domain, we can write this off to the side, x can equal, and you, it's wherever the zeros of cosine r. So you can either write the domain this way, or x can equal pi over 2 plus jumps of pi plus k pi, where k is an integer. And part of the way that you can find out, right, if we think about our big idea, remember that our big idea for tan theta is that it's sine theta over cos theta. Does it make sense that when cos theta is zero, you'd be dividing by zero and that's not allowed? So it makes sense that the domain where x can't be is exactly the same as where cos theta is zero. Because that's going to be bad. And the zeros The zeros for tangent are going to be the exact same thing as the zeros for sine. Because if your numerator is zero, your fraction is zero. So wherever sine theta is zero, tan theta will also be zero. So that helps us find our zeros for tangent as well. And if we look at the graph of tangent, okay, what happens as a result if we're going around our unit circle? Well, if you take sine and divide it by cosine, and you move along the unit circle, tangent gets bigger and bigger as cosine gets smaller and smaller. Does that make sense? Now, graphically, and I've drawn it on here, I don't know if you can see the green line, if you take point P and draw a tangent line, which is touching the circle at only one spot, the length from point P to the x-axis is the actual value of tangent. It's kind of an interesting application. It's not something we've learned before, but it's kind of neat. Notice that if I get right up, if I get closer and closer to here, do you see how that green line is getting longer and longer and longer and longer? And in fact, right where it's undefined, it doesn't even let me get there because it's angry at me because it says I want to draw the green line but if I'm right at the top and I need to connect the green line to the x-axis it'll never connect because they're parallel and so right at the top tangent is undefined doesn't actually work but as soon as I go over to this side now that tangent line can hit the negative x-axis And it comes down over and over again. Whee! Don't those little things look like they're on a roller coaster? Whee! Okay. Too much fun. So that is how the unit circle is related. Now, if you really want to know where other things are graphically, 
where the tangent hits the x-axis, if you would go and have that whole length to where it touches, that's actually the value of secant. The value of cosecant is where that tangent line hits the y-axis. And from that point to the y-axis would be cotangent. Eventually, we'll graph all of those, but that's like I don't do that till the very end of the last year. But if you want to see all the graphs, we can go around and plot the points as it makes them. It's kind of cool. Some neat artwork, I guess. Okay. Now these three graphs, right, these three graphs become new paragraphs and we can go back to chapter one and we can do all the transformations we did in chapter one, but now we have four new graphs, or three new graphs. Oh, the excitement on your faces is just so big, you just can't wait to graph these with Stretches, compressions, reflections, so happy. I'm so glad. So we're going to get things that look like this. Where you have a number in for the A, a number in for the B, a number in for the C, and a number in for the D. Is A vertical or horizontal? Vertical, because it's outside the function. The B would be horizontal, stretch or compression. C would be? Translation horizontal, left or right, and finally the D, vertical translation up and down, and it has to be in factored form, just like our first unit. So now we're going to graph, and in our first unit, when you had a square root or an x cubed graph, on the test or the exam, usually they'll pick like maybe two, sometimes three of them for you to do. But for sine and for cosine, they almost always like to do all four. And it's a little bit annoying if you use the points, because if you do all four, for example, if we look at our sine graph, our sine graph has one, two, three, four, five important points to do. So it could be annoying to do all five points with all four things. So we're going to develop a shortcut. And that's what we're going to do starting now. We're going to look at how each of these stretches, compressions, and translate relate to a characteristic in the original graph. And we'll start with example one. But I think I'll make this just an intro video, so I'll pause it now.